Welcome to Gourmet Brewing. I'm your host, Doug Piper, and I want you to know how much I appreciate you allowing me to join you in growing our beverage skills together. I'm a certified Cicerone and I'm a certified BJCP beer and mead judge, and I'm working on advanced ranks. And these BJCP study groups and webinars are my way of sharing my beverage journey with you. Uh, we've had a couple of recent webinars, had one actually just last night, kind of had a double header this week. Uh, Travis Rupp of Avery Brewing on their Ales of Antiquity series. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Richard Priest on Kvike Yeast, uh, really a spirited webinar, a lot of good discussion there. Had a little diversion with Kruve and Better Coffee and Better Beer. Uh, Scott Ungerman of Anchor Brewing uh, <coughs> led us in some conversation where he was telling us about his open fermentation. Uh, Laura and Gotti on creating, recreating ancient mead recipes and Jennifer Pereira on demystifying diacetyl. So if you missed any of these webinars, you can check them out and the, the rest of the previous programs by clicking the follow link in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Uh, I'll also share a link in the follow up email that's sent after the live event. Today, we have Terrence Sullivan of Sierra Nevada Brewery in Chico, California, USA. Terrence is the creative brand manager and brewery ambassador, but he's also worked for Robert Mondovi Winery and Golden Pacific Brewing prior to joining Sierra over 25 years ago. And in beer years, that's a, that's a long time. <laughs> Terrence focuses on getting new beers from concept to glass. So Terrence, I'm going to bring you on screen here and I want to hear about how nice the weather is in where you're from and just remind everybody where you're from. So I'm, uh, I'm located out in our headquarters in Chico, California. So, um, it's unseasonably warm, uh, this past February and March, unfortunately, um, no rain. Uh, so we're we're experiencing about 78 degrees today um, with uh, north wind, um, which is uh, uh, supposedly storms coming in. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of rain, uh, some snow, hopefully snowpack. Uh, that's what we rely on uh, in this neck of the woods to uh, to keep us going until the the next winter. Well. So. Uh, that's different than our weather. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, we've had rain every third day, nice. pretty much. <laughs> and so I, I have found out uh, my basement has uh, more access to water than I ever realized. <laughs> nice. Well, occasionally we, we, we're fortunate to get a, get a lot of rain, but uh, not, not so far this year. So hopefully we get a big, big March in April to so well, I hope so. so. We don't don't get back into drought situations again. So, so, Terrence, you and I have been discussing doing this for some time, and I'm so excited you found time in your schedule to share your vast experience with us. Just for those that are just now tuning in or maybe have not been on one of the webinars before, can you share just briefly a couple of the highlights that you're going to talk about tonight? Well, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go through our barrel aging program. Um, so our extensive barrel aging program uh, that we're doing. Talk about a, a few beers. We're gonna open up some beers. Uh, tell some Sierra Nevada stories. Uh, a little bit of history. Um, you know, like you said, I've been here 25 years. Um, I've I've seen uh, Sierra Nevada change uh, quite a bit uh, over that time. Uh, I think we were 100,000 barrels uh, when I first started, just went over 100,000 barrels. Now we produce upwards of a million barrels of beer. So uh, the, the, the differences in uh, what it takes to actually uh, to do that. Um, so I, I got to witness a lot of that. Um, you know, I started my career here uh, as the very first graveyard brewer. So uh, at, when I was hired and fully trained on. Uh, we started uh, 24 hours, seven days a week, roughly. It was about six and three quarters uh, of, of days a week. Um, I would shut down the brewery on Sunday night and they would pop it back open at four in the morning. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, and that was on a hundred barrel system, and we were pretty much brewing in those days three hundred and sixty uh, two days a year or something. I think we took a half day off on Thanksgiving, and they would take. Uh, uh, I, w I was the, I was the young brewer on shift, and everybody else had family, so uh, I would always elect to do the uh, the early shift on Christmas Day uh, and go home and uh, uh, spend Christmas uh, kind of by myself until my uh, uh, wife moved uh, to Chico. So, oh wow, oh, look, Susan's on there. There she well, is. Well, and we've also got some calibration beers, right? Uh, we do have some calibration beers. We have uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through pale ale, um, and to kind of guide us into barrel age beer, um, we are going to uh, have just regular narwhal. So our imperial stout uh, that comes out in the fall time. Um, so we're actually drinking 2019 uh, is what I sent you. Um, we'll we'll drink through that, and then we will have the barrel aged narwhal, uh, which is bourbon barrel aged, um, and we'll. We'll taste and contrast and see what happens uh, when uh, when a particular beer like that spends a journey of 12 months in a uh, bourbon barrel, which is actually a fabulous, uh, fabulous thing. I think if I was to come back in another life, I'd want to come back as yeast uh, that uh, uh, harbored inside of a bourbon barrel for 12 months. <laughs> But but they die. I don't off know. Can that happen? Don't they? Can that, yeah, they die off. But you know, <laughs> oh, well, this is awesome. I can't wait to hear more, and I can't wait to jump into these beers. Uh, but just for those that may, this may be the first time they've ever joined one of these webinars. I want to just remind you that if the webinar is not playing correctly, maybe the screens are freezing or whatever. Most of the time, if you just refresh your screen, it will work. Also, Chrome and Firefox work best uh, for this particular platform that I use. And if you can't hear, double check that you've unmuted or turned up your speakers. Uh, down at the, the other day, right? That's right. <laughs> down at the bottom, there's a ask the question button. And uh, if you've got a question for Terrence, uh, please jump down there. It looks like we've got eight questions already in that, which I think is fantastic. Uh, we will jump into this and get those answers. We also have some polls and the polls are kind of giving Terrence a feel for where our audience is. The two questions are, have you ever tasted a Sierra Nevada barrel aged beer before? Uh, Terrence is still running about three fourths no. So a lot of people have not had one. And have you barrel aged a beverage before and about the same number. So looks like three quarters of our audience is not super familiar with barrel age flavors or barrel aged brewing. Um, these are part of a series of webinars that I'm helping the AHA and BJCP study groups that I'm part of. And if you're not a member yet and are interested in exploring the journey, uh, of becoming an advanced beer judge. You can either search the Facebook groups for BJCP 101, 201, Mead or Cider, or I'm going to copy and paste these over in the chat. And we would love to have you join us. Um, there we go. We would love to have you join us. Uh, the 101 group is obvious. Uh, Mead and Cider, I think, are obvious. And 201 are, is for more advanced judges, and those are the differences there. Also note, these webinars, while they're totally free to you, they're provided by the generosity of the Gourmet Brewing patrons through the crowdfunding site Patreon. This is the economic model that I'm using to fund these. And while Terrence is not getting paid anything, uh, nor, nor am I. Um, we, we provide these and there are some direct costs that your funding helps offset. So if you would like to see more of these, uh, please know they're 100% crowdfunded and I hope you'll consider joining our Patreon supporters so future webinars can continue. I also want to thank Frank Christian for his recent financial support, along with regular Patreon supporters, Andy Glidden, Brent Dingus, Omar Bushai, Clay Bunn, Dan Sakai, Gene Jockey, Jerry Pringle, Marino Lanza, Paul Klammer, and Brian Doubt. 
Uh, everyone that has registered will get an email with a link to the recordings, any slides and links to the three B BJC, excuse me, four BJCP study groups. And also just to make you aware, for those of you that are AHA members, uh, I've been nominated for the American Homebrewers Association Governing Committee. Uh, there are 18 people running. Uh, you've got five votes. And if you're an AHA member, and voting is open through the end of March. So I would encourage you and ask you to consider voting. Uh, and if you like these webinars and would like to see the AHA consider more of these kinds of things, uh, my being on the governing committee may have some influence there. Uh, and if you'd like to continue the conversation, I have another Facebook group that is strictly for gourmet brewing, which is a very broad topic. And I would encourage you to join that group also. So Terrence, now that I've got all that stuff behind us, I would love to see us jump into the program. Uh, as soon as I can click on the right button here. There we go. In there. there I am. We're right. going to jump into the secrets of Sierra Nevada's barrel aging program. Well, you at the at the beginning, uh, at the top of the um, feed there, um, you had added a couple links. So I'm going to go in a little bit of uh, talking about one of them is on our barrel age program uh, that we have at Sierra Nevada. And uh, this really, you know, it started out uh, years ago uh, where uh, it was it was actually one one of our brewers uh cell actually worked in the cellar um he had done some travel uh visited some other breweries and uh it was it was probably the early 2000s uh and he visited a couple people that were kind of playing with barrel aging stuff and so he had this idea you know we should uh uh we should get into doing some barrel aging program and and we were fortunate enough we had a there was a distillery down in uh and it's still there down in uh uh, Alameda um, that that got a hold of us called uh, St. George Spirits, uh, and they had, they had actually asked us if we would make uh, work for them uh, so that they could start making uh, some some whiskey, and uh, so we we started doing that for them, and and in exchange they would uh, they would throw some barrels our way, and so literally uh, it first started out of uh, taking some uh, celebration ale and. Uh, aging it in some bourbon barrels uh, that we served at our company party, uh, Christmas party. Uh, and it was just the, uh, uh, it's a cat's meow uh, at that party. And everybody really, you know, celebration ale right here. Uh, so everybody really dug it. And uh, so we thought, ah, okay, let's just start playing with this a little bit more. And, uh, and then we started using just our regular porter and our regular stout uh, and starting get to get to know what what happens in barrels and uh and and the magic that can happen and uh the actual nightmares that can happen as well uh so i so i really want to i want to talk about some of those uh uh you know early on uh we we had nowhere to really store the barrels uh we have a uh, uh those that don't know out there uh we we do an extensive amount of uh, bottle conditioning uh, for our beers, pale porter, stout, celebration ale, and Bigfoot barley wine are all still bottle conditioned, and and then the ones that are you know pale ale in a can is actually can conditioned. Um, so we uh, <clears throat> what we do is we we filter the beers, uh, and we add uh, uh, we'll add sugar and yeast uh, to the bright beer tanks, uh, and then package, uh, and then they they see. Uh, roughly 14 days in a 62 degree warehouse space. Um, so our warehouses are extremely enormous for the size of our brewery, um, holding all that barrel aged, or sorry, all that bottle conditioned beer. Uh, so it, it actually made for a really natural place for us to actually um, house our, our barrel program. Uh, the only problem is, is uh, as we started to expand, um, in uh, our production of pale ale and celebration ale uh, around, you know, the, the uh, you know, 2005 to 2010 range, uh, we would get really pressed for space. And so what this led to was, is we would have to 
maneuver those, uh, uh, as you see there, the, uh, the barrels around our warehouse uh, and kind of uh, pin them in certain locations. We'd drop barrels. Uh, we'd make a complete mess of our warehouse, uh, track a bunch of uh, uh, sticky uh, beer around uh, the entire, from our forklifts. Uh, around the entire warehouse and it just became kind of a, a nightmare that uh, was waiting for some sort of cross contamination or infection with uh, with all of our uh, uh, bottle conditioned beer so so it was uh, probably I uh, can't even remember the year but it was probably right around uh, 2012 or so somewhere around there uh, where where Ken uh, started kind of talking to us about okay if we're going to kind of expand this and do it the right way, we need to uh, figure out a place to store all of our barrels. Ideally, would have been on site, but um, uh, he had he had a warehouse that uh, he owned in uh, you know probably about two miles from the brewery, and so that is now our barrel room. Uh, we host some parties out there um, and have a good time out there, but uh, mainly uh, for for storing barrels, we can roughly store about. 2,500 to 2,800 uh, of those oak barrels, those 55 gallon uh, uh, bourbon barrels that you saw in that photo. Um, so it's uh, it's quite a bit of capacity, uh, but it allows us to uh, to also do some experimenting and things like that, and, and kind of keep everything off site. So it's uh, it's 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 not um, kind of some issues with cross contamination. We built a wall now, and we actually. Have a smaller little section of that barrel room that uh, is used for uh, doing sours and kind of playing with uh, sours that we're still pretty young in kind of uh, learning uh, about those and um, you know we've produced a few beers in very small volumes uh, that are that are sours we we have this great beer that we did uh, called big chico creek uh, it was uh, really really nice uh, you know kind of a traditional creek style um, and and there is a big Chico Creek uh, that runs through town so it was only natural to call it a big Chico Creek right so but um, but anyways that's kind of how the the barrel program really kind of started out is is really f you know for fun and um, and and we really enjoy uh, it, it's it's a little bit of uh, well it's 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 some luck. Um, it's uh, it's a lot of art. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of tasting. Um, you know, um, it's definitely uh, you. You have barrel, and we'll get into some of the questions that I'm um, kind of stepping ahead a little bit. But uh, yeah, you know, you're you're tasting the barrels, and uh, and and yeah, some of them go south. Some of them are beautiful. Um, uh, some of them. We find they're so amazing that we actually kind of isolate them and uh, and do uh, uh, you know uh, storm just for five gallon kegs that we use for special events and uh, tap takeovers and things of that nature. Uh, you know, I'll give an example. Just recently, uh, uh, and and the thing about having a twenty, which is actually really cool, is having like twenty eight hundred uh, barrels. Uh, some get lost, you know. Like you forget, they're all labeled that we, we know what's out there. We know the inventory, but no one looks at a spreadsheet, you know? And so, so sometimes I'll come across, uh, recently they were doing some, uh, uh, barrel aged Bigfoot, um, that we were doing, uh, in, in kegs, uh, and, uh, they came across some five year old, uh, barrel aged Bigfoot. And so we, we kind of isolated some of those and, uh, and, and saved them for a special occasion. So. This is really beautiful beer. Yeah, barrel aged Bigfoot sounds delicious. Yeah, I and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you because I, I know I'm maybe uh, hopefully there's some people out there that have tasted. I'd like to see if uh, anyone has tasted barrel aged Bigfoot and can write a little note there. But uh, in my opinion, this is strictly my opinion because and I have a very strong one here at the brewery. Uh, luckily, sometimes they listen to me. Sometimes they just tell me to shut up. But uh, but but I will be honest is is Bigfoot is like sometimes a little, to me, a little too harsh. I've always actually asked, hey, can we make a uh, more of a, uh, uh, 
ramp down uh, IBU version of our Bigfoot, maybe use the same hops and everything, but just not try to get as aggressive uh, of a bitterness on it uh, and age those in bourbon barrels. But like that five year one that we did, like that's yeah. what I loved about it is because the, the, the BUs had kind of uh, died off so much that, uh, that it was, it was more kind of English, a little English style uh, in its taste. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll have to share an embarrassing story. Uh, I did a tasting BJCP tasting exam Saturday, uh, a week ago, and Steve Morgan hosted that for us. And one of the beers was a 2008 um, Bigfoot. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, in a tasting exam, you're, you're told it's a barley wine, and an American barley wine, and I'm going, oh, my gosh, wh where are the American hops? There were none, zero. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and that, that's – so that's one of my, my things is I really love um, – uh, I love going through those, you know, I do, I, we don't, I don't do it all the time. Uh, I get a, invited. There's, there's a, uh, I'm going to forget his name, but there's, uh, someone in, in, in uh, down in Sacramento area and he has, uh, supposedly enough for several years of doing, uh, 20, 25 years of, uh, of Bigfoot. And he actually, I think he's done somewhere. He actually auctioned them off, um, for for a tasting and he donated the money to some uh you know homebrew club or something like that so it was a really pretty pretty cool idea um but i i, I love the um uh you, you know the the nuances of how it changes and i have my certain years that i like uh, better than others and and for me like ideally uh bigfoot is uh i like for it to be at least about six months old and i like it up to about or yeah, six months old up to about 18, 18 to two years is my ideal kind of range that I really like to to taste. My glass is empty, Terrence. Yeah, I know. So we so we start with the first calibration yeah, beer. I'm, I'm totally down with that. So um, I can open mine here too, right? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Aha. Lovely. Oh, that's beautiful. I might have to wait a Great. moment to top that guy off. You got a little aggressive on your pour, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing it with the wrong hand. I would tell you, uh, Char Charlie Bamforth would be proud of you. You pour with vigor, right? So, well, yeah, I tried. more, more maltiness with age on Bigfoot barley wine. Like, definitely that, that maltiness really starts coming out, you know. Um, and getting kind of back to the Bigfoot... Um, uh, some people might remember that are out there. I mean, we have 155 people. Um, there's definitely probably some people that remember our, our bottles used to be uh, twist off uh, versus pry off crowns. Uh, and we really saw an aging difference, uh, the pry offs and the twist offs um, uh, after we switched over. So the pry offs tend to age a little bit slower. So, all right. So we're in our calibration beer, right? Yep. This is uh, uh, our our flagship um, pale ale. There we go. And that's how it's supposed to look, isn't it? Oh, that's a beaut right there. That is a great pour. Yeah. So uh, it's it's funny because I I, I love when we uh, and we do we don't enter it as often as we used to, but uh, uh, we and and I, and I love because if you go on the you're right the B, BJCP uh, guidelines right is is Sierra Nevada is one of the calibration beers right it um, is and uh, and and I, and I love whenever uh, we've entered this into the GABF before and uh, uh, we've gotten comments of uh, wrong category uh, which I which I always I get a kick out of uh, but uh, but you know it's not it's not dry hopped like a lot of pale ales nowadays are. Uh, it's aggressively hopped, uh, late hop additions, 100% um, cascade, whole cone hops, 100% whole cone hops on this beer. 
Um, you know, we got a little uh, C60 uh, caramel malt in it. And so, uh, you know, just kind of add that hint of kind of amber color there. So, so if you were to help us walk through Terrence uh, as the brewer, what are some of the descriptors you would you would use to describe the flavor and aroma? Oh, it's like beautiful to me. It's 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 like my 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 life really. Uh, I'm I'm just teasing you. Uh, it has a lot of uh, you know I, I get grapefruit notes. Um, I like I love the fruitiness on it. You know, it's probably got a little bit more that aggressive fruitiness for a lot from the bottle conditioning uh, process um, with this beer. Um, I love the kind of it's got that classic Cascade uh, piney hop character. Uh, kind of uh, pine needle or fresh, fresh cut pine um, notes to it. It's got a little, little back end malt sweetness to it. Uh, not overwhelming. Um, uh, the bitterness, uh, I think, is uh, absolutely beautiful for the actual beer that it is. It's just got a nice, nice bitterness to it. Um, not, not too aggressive and. Uh, uh, enough so that you know it's there. Three months old, good hop nose. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I agree. I, you know, it's it's one of the things uh, we we put on every one of our well, not every one of our packages. Now that I look at some of our new new beers, uh, but uh, you know, Ken's original statement of purest ingredients and finest quality. Um, finest quality is definitely something that uh, is instilled in every Sierra Nevada employee um, when they um, start working here. Um, we take great pride in uh, especially packaging because uh, as any brewer out there will know, um, uh, your beer is only as good as how you package it because uh, you can take a, a absolutely phenomenal beer uh, and screw it up in a matter of, uh, I don't know, 12 ounces, 12 <laughs> ounces at a time. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. And, 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 and that's, you know, so, so getting back to that too, that, that bottle conditioning flavor that's on, on this beer, that real fruitiness that kind of comes out of this. Um, uh, if, if you, uh, have done any bottle conditioning at, at all, uh, you'll know, um, like, like for us, we're, we're, we're pretty much dialed in. So we do sensory every day on our, our, our release sensory. So pale ale actually comes up to our sensory department on day 10. That's usually when we taste it. You know, if it's a weekend or whatever, and it rolls over, we'll taste it day 10, 11 or 12. Right. Um, and us as, uh, uh, sensory experts, at least for, uh, I'll, I'll call us sensory experts because we know our beer really well. Um, you, you can really start, you, you get a little diacetyl notes uh, at 10 days whenever you're tasting it. Uh, also too is like we'll, we'll see it in the winter time um, when, uh, it's kind of funny because I'll tell a story that, uh, that happened a long time ago. Uh, uh, we, we would, every once in a while, whenever it would come you know, December or whatever. Uh, and and it, it still comes up. Uh, December, January, we always kind of, wow, you know, the bottle conditioning process is taking a little bit longer. Um, it, it, it's, the, it's the little things that matter, right? Uh, so when your warehouse is 28 degrees um, and, and the, the beauty of Mills River, actually, that's one, one of the things that we did knowing that they have colder winters there. Um, uh, the warehouse uh, where we store our glass uh, is temperature controlled, uh, where in Chico it's not temperature controlled, uh, or not as well. Um, and so a lot of times, uh, you can, you can actually look back at the calendar when you're drinking 10 day beer, that's a little bit higher diacetyl levels. We can usually look back at the, uh, uh, the temperature 10 days ago, and it's pretty, pretty certain it's going to be around 28 to 32 degrees. So, you know, putting, uh, putting 12 ounces of, uh, of a beer that's 62 degrees into a bottle that's uh, that's you know 30 degrees, uh, it, it really uh, 
kind of retards that uh, fermentation process early on. Um, so, but. Well, Terrence, is any uh, last comments on the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, BJCP example style, before we move into the next one, which is the Narwhal mm -hmm. uh, Imperial Stout? I didn't quite line that up right. There we go. Okay. So this is going to nicely lead us into our barrel aging discussion. Now, this one is not barrel aged, correct? This is not barrel aged. So this is a traditional, um, you know, it, and honestly, so so this is in a, in a program that we call our uh, high altitude series. Uh, so Bigfoot is a high altitude beer. Uh, and the idea when we came out with this beer was to kind of something to complement higher ABV, the drinker that wants to have something, you know, for a special occasion. And um, Imperial Stout was was an easy uh, thing for us to kind of think about. We had actually, uh, so I, I mentioned uh, uh, Susan Rankert's on, on the uh, uh, listening in right now. Uh, she was uh, part of our uh, beer camp program that we had. And uh, and we really, uh, we had a lot of people that actually came through our uh, beer camp program. Um, and it's kind of a, a day in the life at Sierra Nevada and you get to make a beer of your uh, liking. Uh, we had a lot of people that made uh, uh, Imperial Stout. So that was our playground to start uh, learning about uh, Imperial Stouts and making uh, uh, and dialing in uh, this beer. Uh, the first year we actually made this beer, it, w it won a silver medal at the GABF. Um, and I, I was telling you that story last week is uh, that same exact beer. Uh, we decided, oh, let's put it in bourbon barrels, uh, put it in bourbon barrels. And the following year we entered it into the uh, barrel age uh, strong, uh, strong beer category and it won the silver. So the same exact uh, beer won the, the silver for uh, Imperial Stout, uh, and then the next year won the barrel-aged uh, program. But So anyways, uh, barrel-aged narwhal, just, uh, or sorry, this is not barrel-aged narwhal, this is regular narwhal, uh, just a beautiful Imperial Stout, uh, just, you know, all the characteristics that, I haven't, I haven't even stuck my nose in one of these in a while. So, oh, just, I, I, I it's got everything you want, right? It's got the coffee, it's, it's got the roast malts. It's got a little bit of tobacco. It's got a little bit of smoke. Um, you know, one of, one of the, the great things that that I love, um, well, I love drinking beer. You know that, Dick. Uh, but the the memories uh, that, that sensory brings to us, right? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there on a, on a limb here and talk a little bit about uh, sensory and, and – how 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 it garnishes these these memories of of fine things in your life and one of them with uh stouts that have a little bit of tobacco and a little bit of smoke character to them remind me of my father um, um not not that it was a good thing but my dad used to smoke cigarettes in the rambler station wagon uh as we rode in the back seat and uh it brings fond memories of those days when we would go on road trips so it's kind of weird, kind of morbid, but you know, hey, that's me. It is. It is such a, a smooth stout. Yes, um, it's just uh, easy drinking. A uh, little chocolate, little coffee. It's not particularly bitter. Uh, just kind of a mild bitterness. Yeah, it's. it's uh, you know, it's it's got some hop bitterness. It's got a little bit of that kind of black malt. Uh, bitterness to it, astringency. To me, one of the things I like about this beer is it's not overly sweet. Uh, yeah. A lot of times you can get uh, imperial stouts, um, you know, and as far as like home brewing, you know, that's that's one of the things is like um, trying to kind of master that so you get uh, a good amount of fermentable sugars in there so that you're not um, overly sweet and um, kind of off a little bit, you know? Um, but so, so Terrence, I'm intrigued with the glass. So mm. can you, can you share a little bit about this particular glass? It looks very special. It is. 
it's our it's our fortieth year. So uh, Ken Ken started Sierra Nevada in uh, November of uh, nineteen eighty, and um, he uh, uh, had a dream of uh, uh, starting up a little brewery um, where he was gonna uh, make a living for him and a few people, and uh, and it it changed the world of craft beer, or actually, like I guess there wasn't a world of craft beer. Uh, in those days, you know, there was Anchor, there was uh, Boulder, there was uh, uh, New Albion, uh, maybe Grants. Uh, you know, there was there was a few here and there uh, scattered throughout the United States, but I don't think he ever envisioned uh, where where we are today, um, and that the influence that Sierra Nevada would have on the uh, the world of craft beer. Um, but, um, you know, I, I told you, I, I brought something special to kind of share to everyone. So we actually just packaged this and we, we literally tasted it today. It'll be out next month, but it's, uh, it's a, uh, retro, we're calling it a retro pack, uh, of oh, pale ale. Up, okay, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get, get a bottle. Here we so, go. Uh, so get a bottle of it. Uh, but it's our original label, and it actually on here it, it tells the story of. Uh, so we're going to sell this one for a few months uh, uh, in the summertime, and so it tells the story of uh, of this label, right? And and so Ken Ken had this vision of whenever the artist actually first did it. It was it was green like today's label, uh, where it was all green, uh, but it was it was kind of a, a fade in and out of green. Um, so whenever he, he actually sent this to uh, to the vendor. Uh, to print the labels, um, he he couldn't afford to actually go um, to the to the print shop and look at them because it was it was a, a quite a drive away, and plus he was you know brewing all the time, um, so he couldn't afford to actually go. So he said, "Ah, just don't worry about it. Send them, you know." And then they came in and they had this like bluish uh, blue color on them, you know, and uh, and he's like, "Ah, well, uh, that's gonna have to just be it, right?" So. Uh, so that was the very first pale ale label, uh, and, and the history behind it. And, uh, so, but, uh, but yeah, the, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's quite an honor to, to work with Ken Grossman and, and kind of, you know, realize what, what he has done, uh, for this industry and, and how much he's actually helped, um, you know, small brewers and, uh, you know, if, if you go back to his early days, uh, he was fortunate enough to to have fritz maytag that was close by uh that really influenced uh him uh helped him um sold him equipment um you know he had a uh doug molman who was a brewer at anheuser bush in um he was the uh brewmaster in in fairfield california um who they befriended each other and uh and doug would help Ken out quite a bit uh, with, uh, you know, knowledge as well as some equipment and things of that nature that really kind of helped him uh, get moving forward. I think I should probably start reading some of these things over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, and, and speaking of Ken and Fritz, uh, Ken, Fritz, and also Charlie Papazian had some, some, items that were donated to the Smithsonian. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That was actually a really as kind of, kind of neat. You know, I think that was a, that was one of those, uh, those ones when, uh, cause I think you were actually um, at the brewery that weekend, whenever he was, uh, he was there, he was actually uh, had come down to uh, babysit his grandkids um, yeah. and stopped into the brewery and uh, chatted with us a little bit. And uh, he was like a kid at a candy store, you know, uh, picking out that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, Ken has always, always been that way. He's like really, uh, uh, he loves eBay. I'll tell you that he, uh, he, he loves eBay. He loves uh, shopping around on eBay. And a lot of times any home brewers out there, he'll actually call you out if you're trying to sell his kegs. Uh, cause they belong to him. They don't belong to you. Uh, so, uh, so anyways, uh, um, just, just forewarning there. Right. Uh, but Ken, uh, Ken will get on there and he loves buying like old historical, uh, stuff, you know? And so if you actually come to our breweries, uh, there is an, a, a, an aspect of it, of a lot of old equipment and, um, uh, historical items, uh, you know, old shovels from a uh, hop harvesting day and, and, you know, I, I told you about the barrel room. There's actually the same size room right next door to it 
uh, that houses a lot of other uh, stuff he's bought on eBay over the years of, um, you know, uh, malt, malt barley bins. Uh, uh, we, we just actually, we acquired and we really want to kind of get it set up. Uh, UC Davis, the original brew house uh, from UC Davis, which is a five gallon unit that I used to brew on whenever I went to school there uh, and quite a, probably quite a few uh, other, uh, other brewers. Uh, we kind of, uh, we really want to resurrect it and actually uh, start brewing on it because uh, we probably figure there's more brewmasters that brewed on that system than any other system in the world. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah Crispy Fry wrote in there. He said Ken dressed him down once for using uh, a keg. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he'll do that, too. He'll he'll doesn't matter whose brewery it is. He, he, he wants to know. Uh, um, well, we, while we're talking about the breweries, um, the uh, image behind me, can you share what, what that is? Oh, yeah, that's the tasting room. You look really good in there, too. Um, that's, our, that's our tasting room in Mills River. So uh, uh, maybe, maybe a show of hands of how many people out there have been, uh, been to the Mills River Brewery or the Chico Brewery. Um, Mills River Brewery was... Uh, you know, we built that in uh, 2014, and it was really uh, uh, <laughs> it, I was going to say it was a really fun project, but it was actually really a pain in the ass. I got to got to admit, uh, it was long. Uh, it, it, it probably went over budget by a lot, um, but it is absolutely beautiful. It, it is uh, maybe one of the most beautiful breweries I've ever um, stepped foot in and uh, I'm not saying that because I work uh, work for the company it's uh, it, you know and it's built the way a brewery is supposed to be built if you've ever been out to Chico uh, recently you'll, you'll realize that uh, it's almost we call it uh, if, if you're familiar with Northern California it's the Winchester mystery house of, uh, of breweries uh, because it's uh, uh, you know our bottle shop is probably 150 yards from uh, where our filtration uh, uh, department is, and that's not really the most efficient way to run a run a brewery. But it's the only thing we could do back in the day. So, and and the hallway, right, right back there. Right. That's the that's, that's, that's the where all room. his tools are. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Down the hallways, yeah, yeah. Uh, cork floors and uh, and all the all the wood you see. Well, the wood on the on the ceiling there is all uh, that's wood that was harvested on the uh, from the property uh when we were building the brewery um and then all the uh you'll see the wooden staves from uh from all the barrels uh that make up uh the bar itself yep yep exactly and up around the uh the uh, edge of the entire uh facility is all uh barrel staves yep yep, yep. all those up there on the yep. walls too yep it's uh it's pretty cool pretty cool so, yeah. Well, and speaking of this, uh, where we ran into Ken uh, was actually right in this room, and it was at a Alpha Hops meeting. Now, I know you're going to talk about Alpha Hops, but do you want to touch on it right quick since we were in one of the places? Where's the glassware? We're going to use this at the very end. Wait, how do I get that so it's like kind of you can see a, I don't know, yeah, maybe, maybe. It's a wolf, little wolf. But anyways, it's a private, uh, it's a private club that we started uh, five years ago. So we're in the sixth year of it, um, and it's uh, originally it was, uh, I think, two hundred and fifty members, um, and uh, it was not really talked about too much on our our website, uh, and it sold out really quick, um, and from that time on uh we did a friends and family um sign up sheet we've expanded this year we're 450 members uh not certain we can go much higher than that uh just to try to uh facilitate that many people the beer the beer part is not an issue um but uh so it's a private uh private club um it, it you you get nine different beers two bottles of each, uh, all of them so far we've always made are barrel aged beers. So some sours, uh, uh, but it's almost like a playground for us. So it's those little experimental batches. Uh, it only goes out to the actual members. Um, we throw, uh, we have three releases. So it's three different beers. 
uh, three times a year we'll release them and we throw an absolutely, you've been to a few of them, uh, an absolutely amazing party uh, with uh, where you get to try all the beers on tap. So you don't have to drink them right away. You can kind of play it by ear of how you think they're going to age out. And we give recommendations and uh, serve you some food and some other nice, nice beers uh, and so, have a good old time. So Terrence, it is an understatement on finding out information on alpha hops. Cause yes. I'm telling you, I tried, I knew what it was called and it was almost impossible to get information. So we, we, I'm sure we've wet some appetites here. Can I share that info at Sierra Nevada email address? Yes, that is uh, alpha hop one word at Sierra All right. Nevada. I'll, I'll type it in. I'll... You, you type it in if you don't mind. Yeah. So if I screw it up, it's my fault, right? Well, no, I had my keyboard moved. Uh, <laughs> no, so I I've got no, this I'm narwhal. Teasing I'm teasing you. Uh, I think See, I'm, I'm, right. I'm ahead of you that. here. I'm getting the next pour red. There it is. So, so we're sold out for 2020. Um, but if you send me an email, I have a folder that I slide everything into that folder. Um, and, uh, and come next year when we, we send out the invites at the, uh, let's, it's usually like October, uh, for the following year. Um, I always include those emails in the, um, uh, friends and family, uh, email. So first goes out to the members, they get first uh, right of refusal. Um, so they, they, usually we, we get, uh, you know, 70% of the people sign back up, 75. Um, and so we always have, have uh, some memberships available at that point. So. Well, I anticipate 158 uh, emails today. <laughs> yeah, okay. That sounds good. Because, and it is, I will speak from experience, uh, while it is not cheap, it is very unique and you run into some great people and, you know, to sit there and hang out for a few hours with Terrence and Ken Grossman and other local brewers, uh, it's, it's just a unique experience. Yeah. And, and for me, like running one of those programs, it's, 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 it's not as easy as it, it kind of sounds, uh, you know, to try to. Uh, accommodate everybody's palate. Uh, you know, like he, it, the the one beer that I loved in this last set was the Pigs in a Kilt, which was uh, which was a barrel aged. Uh, it was barrel aged narwhal that was transferred into maple syrup barrels, uh, made up about sixty uh, percent or a little bit more, is almost seventy percent of all the beer uh, was that, and then we had a Scotch ale uh, that was barrel aged in a a true peated scotch barrel. Um, so it had the peated smokiness. And and, and I, I don't know if you remember me saying it, it was almost like three beers in one. Uh, it had this uh, kind of maple, mapley aroma. Uh, the, the taste was uh, definitely uh, imperial stout with hardly any smoke on it until right at the back end. Uh, after you swallowed the beer, you got this kind of waft of like, uh, smoke. I thought that one was phenomenal. Yeah. And it was yeah. just, just a delicious beer. Well, speaking of delicious beers, yes. uh, we've got a narwhal here that's barrel aged. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got these guys lined up because you're going to oh, kind of do a sorry. compare and contrast, right? Yeah. So I'm going to, yep. So I know someone said on here, it's hard to really find. Did you, did you actually share that, uh, that search uh, window with everybody, like for, for finding our beers. I, so I did the, not, but I might be able to find it. I'll, I'll send that with the follow-up email. Um, and that to me, uh, we have a, a, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'll probably get yelled at for saying this. Um, and, and Susan and Jeff know me well enough that uh, I like to, uh, to, to, share my my true opinion uh our beer finder on our website is uh uh it's not it, it's it it needs some help um it works uh but uh but i like the one that i sent you uh and so uh anyways uh because i punched in uh this beer uh from your zip code uh and i think there was 17 locations where you can find it um, this is per, uh, I know total wines, uh, has barrel aged narwhal. Um, but we just came out with this, this January, uh, this is in four packs, uh, 16 ounce cans. Um, 
and it's phenomenal beer. Um, and we're, we just had a meeting this morning. We're talking about ramping it up for next year. We're planning on doing 1200 barrels of this beer this year. So anyways, all right. Oh, so, wow. That is nice. This is what happens when Narwhal spends 12 months into a bourbon barrel. Oh, and you're going to right off the gate. You're going to get that kind of bourbon, that vanilla kind of oaky characteristic it's got a little bit of you can kind of get a little bit of that bourbon character in the aroma for sure uh oh the the definitely the vanilla on the back back end have you tasted it yet doug it's fabulous. I have. And and what a nice beer to barrel age to begin with, because your your stout is relatively subtle compared to a lot of stouts. And so it leaves plenty of room there for the vanilla and the bourbon characteristics to just be a nice complex drink yeah. i mean yeah really yeah. nice beer i i would i would agree uh a hundred percent uh you know that's a great way of describing that that um you know i i think the balance of our uh imperial stout just the narwhal itself of how it's so balanced all the way across the board um you know it's no nowhere overwhelming in certain characteristics they're all just well matched together um really does lend to uh accentuating the uh bourbon barrel uh in in this version uh just because it it, it that kind of comes to the comes to the front of the beer i would say and, and that's what leads it uh along the way and and that's and i think that's what you want in a, in a barrel aged beer um in my personal opinion um, so, so Terrence, this is a good chance. Uh, I'm going to look at the poll again. And the poll says, have you ever tasted a Sierra Nevada barrel aged beer before? And we're about split 50 50. Okay. And the same is, have you ever barrel aged a beverage before? So half our audience, you know, has really not had a barrel aged beer. So can you walk us through? The, what the barrel age, the flavor descriptors of, and, and, and touch on the, uh, the Narwhal to begin with, and then the characteristics that are added uh, when it is barrel aged. Well, what I, what I pick up on, on these for sure is, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit about on the regular Narwhal of kind of that, that bitterness um, and the astringency that's, that's nice, you know, it's there. Um, you really start kind of losing some of that. I get a little bit more, uh, like if I go side by side on these beers, you know, you have that bitterness and you have that kind of astringency a little bit pops a little bit more. Uh, and, and once you get it now in that bourbon barrel, is that from the wood, the astringency? I think, well, no, the, the, I was talking about the astringency on just the regular regular narwhal, oh, right? And, yeah. and how I, I find that it, that it, that it mellows it um, in in the bourbon, and and maybe some of that too is like I get this almost kind of residual sweetness, a uh, little bit more sweetness out of the bourbon barrel version. Uh, I I wouldn't say that it's actually analyzed as a sweeter beer. Um, it's just the perception that you get. Uh, I think, uh, once you start probably the vanilla notes. Yeah. I think, I think once, and also once you start like losing a little bit of that, uh, that bitterness and astringency, uh, over time, uh, for the aging, uh, you know, the oxidation, uh, that takes place during the barrel aging process, uh, is probably going to, uh, uh, you know, kind of round out those flavors and kind of, mold them a little bit more and uh soften them i guess is, is probably a great way of saying that but uh you know honestly like uh you know uh, us is and, and kind of going back to that of like the history of uh of uh building our barrel program is like uh you know one one of the things that uh 
going back to saying what Ken kind of thinks of, uh, of quality and quality standards, uh, one of the biggest no-nos is oxidation, right? And he is just a stickler on uh, the canning line and the bottling lines must, you know, adhere to a certain, uh, uh, you know, DO amount and, uh, you know, what what our levels can be and what we put on hold and what we dump if, if our DOs get too high. Um, and when you when you think about it, uh, you're taking beer and you're putting it in a barrel that's going to swell and, you know, uh, contract and and all that kind of stuff. And you're literally splashing it into a barrel that has very little CO2 uh, blanketing or anything like that. And um, so it's kind of contrary. But uh, but so, some some beers lend uh, to that. Um, uh, you know, you. you you, you definitely don't want to oxidize uh, an imperial stout, but once you start putting it in a bourbon barrel and you start getting some bourbon characteristics or rum characteristics or some of the spirits that are in there, um, it really, uh, it, it can be magical. Uh, and that's that, that's kind of what I was telling you a little bit of that, that art and, and magic that happens when you're barrel aging. So, so comparing these two and for the, the fifty percent of the audience have never had a barrel aged beer. Uh, essentially, the Narwhal has chocolate, coffee, a um, little bit of hops. It's not terribly bitter, and most of the hops don't seem to be terribly citrusy. Yeah, uh, they seem to be more like European hops to me. Yeah, um, and then you add to it the barrel aging, which is how long do they? age in the barrel? It's roughly 12 months. I think if we averaged them out, uh, you know, obviously this is a blend. Um, you know, each one of our packagings is r roughly about 800 barrels of, uh, not, sorry, uh, more like 600 barrels uh, that we're doing at a time uh, when we're doing this. So um, you're going to have anything from 10 to 10 to 14 months. Um, you know, sometimes some of them are 16 months old. Um, so, but um so, you, so you're adding to the chocolate and the coffee, uh, basically bourbon and vanilla, yeah, and and yeah, just you, a smoothness. I think that just uh, is uncharacteristic from a normal imperial stout. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's uh, that that you know that, and and that's I I do I tend to like uh, bourbon barrel aging a little bit more. Um, than than working with some other spirits uh and and again that's my personal opinion we have some of our barrel guys that really love the rum uh using rum barrels uh rum barrels are, are tough because uh the quality that you get sometimes uh, i knew when we were first kind of sourcing out uh barrels until we got some kind of uh, suppliers we could really rely on and allow them to kind of pick and choose our barrels for us prior to them actually getting to the brewery um, we, we did some, uh, some night thinking of nightmare, uh, scenarios is we did a, a pretty good run, not a lot. I mean, it was, it was 20, 20, 40 barrels or something. Uh, and it was a rum barrel age. I can't, I want to say it was a quad, maybe a uh, Belgian quad. Um, and, and when they, they were kind of tasting the barrels, uh, probably some of them skipped them. And they didn't really kind of like notice uh, when they were doing the, the blend tasting of adding everything. But when we got it into sensory, um, uh, we dumped all, every bit of it because it was so metallic. Uh, and it made us go to the barrels and look at the barrels. And some of them had like chunks of steel uh, inside the barrel. Uh, so whether that was that was used at the rum distillery or whatever i don't know but we've we've had the same problem with like tequila barrels where there was uh there was nails hammered that they couldn't see like they puttied mm -hmm. over the uh, the nails and the nails were sticking into the beer and so it was probably okay for uh you know they probably wanted that characteristic in whatever tequila they were they were putting it in but um uh or whatever, whatever barrels they were for. But, uh, but when we got them and of course they're going to dry out a little bit, the, these nails rusted, uh, and then we're adding, adding beer on top of it and you, you end up with this super metallic crap. So Terrence, we're at the bottom of the hour. And so 
I wonder, if, before we jump into the questions, it looks like you've got 15 of them. Uh, it looks like in the chat, there's a lot of questions really associated with aging. You know, is there any breadth that you pick up with age? Uh, do you think this, this can would age well? Uh, so can you talk about the aging side? So, yeah. So, okay. So one of the, one of the things that, uh, again, again, getting back to Ken and his, uh, uh, his stress on quality and what, how quality matters. Um, one of the things that we did do when we started to expand our barrel program is, uh, we, we put in a pasteurizer. Um, and, uh, so we do a little, a little, fa uh, flash, flash pasteurization, um, of all of our barrel age beers. Um, a lot of the alpha hop ones though, uh, that we used to make, uh, we didn't have enough volume to actually do it. Um, so it, it, anything that's going to see a packaging line, so whether it's going to go into a, uh, a bottle or in this case, a can is actually pasteurized. So we do kind of, we don't want to run that risk, um, uh, infecting, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of barrels of, uh, pale ale and torpedo and hazy little thing and all those kind of things. Uh, so we did actually implement that, you know, Ken, Ken was always kind of, um, you know, uh, more of a traditional brewer and not really into pasteurizing, but when you're starting to mess with barrels, it's a non-traditional aspect. And, you know, we do some stuff with wine barrels, uh, that are probably going to hold some bread more than, uh, than maybe a bourbon barrel or anything like that. Um, uh, we, we, we do pasteurize. So, so as we're talking about barrel aging, do we want to open this guy? I'll, I'll open it. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So this is, so this is, okay, now we're going to get into kind of some far out stuff. Uh, so I was telling you about this and I decided, okay, I'm going to send this to you because I was telling you about it last week. So um, I answer a lot of our questions on uh, uh, beer advocate uh, that we have. And, and one of them was around this beer uh, and, and, uh, one of uh, someone that was chiming in on there um, was saying how to take a IPA and age it in bourbon barrels is absolutely idiotic, um, which I will tell you when we were first introduced to do this by our barrel program, both Steve Dressler and myself said uh, the same exact uh we have the same exact sentiments about it and uh, until we tasted it. And mm. then we went, holy moly. Okay. You can do this. Um, so a nice sound to it. Uh, I would say that what lends to it a little bit is torpedo is not uh, a trish traditional, uh, traditional IPA by today's standards. Uh, right. Uh, torpedo is uh, a little bit on the maltier side. Uh, hop wise, it's uh, it's very aggressive. Um, so this is, and this is our alpha hop um, glass. So get this all all looking pretty for you. Oh, that looks gorgeous, Doug. So that, it, it, that is a beautiful beer. Yeah, this is not a, a traditional thing. And then so this is one of those ones where you actually let your 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 barrel guys uh, go to town, uh, you know, let them kind of uh, be artists, uh, let them let them be creative uh, because you never know what you'll get uh, on the other side. Um, and so they had this idea they were going to take torpedo and they're going to age it in bourbon barrels and they were going to. Uh, and this is not barrel aged that long. Uh, it's roughly, uh, probably on, on average, uh, most of the, the barrels are probably six, six to seven months old. Um, uh, but they dry hop the barrels, uh, prior to, uh, pulling the beer out. So as it's sitting in the barrel, probably at about 
five and a half months of age. Uh, they were going to aggressively dry hop those barrels uh, with whole cone uh, citra hops um, and, uh, and let it do its work. So this, uh, again, you kind of get that bourbon hit. You get a little bit of vanilla in the nose. Yeah, but the hops are so subtle. Yeah. I mean, for a torpedo, which is one you just ram the hops in, uh, it totally unexpected. Yeah. It's just just a little bit of hops. Yep. And a little bit of bourbon, but just kind of a touch and a little Well, I, I always feel, I always feel that torpedo has it's got a little bit of fruitiness, but I've always felt that it has a uh it's it's got a almost a cedar cedar wood characteristic to me. Mm -hmm. That's how I describe it uh in our uh our sensory tastings. Uh it's got exactly some, it's got some pine citrus type of notes. But I do get that that cedar wood characteristics, which I think actually comes out in this. Um, do you remember what I told you when when you told me that you were going to send this, mm -hmm. and I said it probably tastes like toothpaste and Coca Cola. Yeah, does it taste like toothpaste and Coca Cola? No, wow. my gosh, it is good. Yeah, it's really uh, so. And cedar is an excellent description. I guess that is the the hops just mellowing out. Yeah, and. A, a little bit of the bourbon and and I guess oak. Yep, and and this uh, you know torpedo has uh, uh, has a lot of magnum hops in it. Um, it's got uh, citra hops, um, so a lot of those a lot of those magnums I think come through um, on it. You know, magnum's not a traditional dry hop or a late hop to add or dry hop with, but. Uh, but it, it works on this beer. And I think a lot of it has to do with just the, the maltiness of, uh, of Torpedo. You know, Torpedo came out, um, you know, right about the time that IPAs were starting to, you know, it's 10 years old. Uh, last year was its 10th year um, since we came out with Torpedo. So Torpedo is, uh, you know, the process of Torpedo is, uh, um, is kind of the, the, aging process um i'm gonna get a little funky on you here i'm gonna do something you we didn't go over you know earlier but i'm gonna pull oh, up I'm those, gonna, those torpedo pictures i brought up you know, i'm trying to remember i'm almost thinking i i messed up and did not get those on that no you didn't but i'm can i share my can i share my screen yeah of course you can okay if i remember how how do i do that again uh, go up to the top with that little gear symbol. Oh, and it says share, right? Yep. That's all there is. And you, you did it before. Oh, so it. yeah, I can do it. Let's see. That's not the same. I'm going to close that down. Okay. Where's the gear? Uh, top center. Put, put the pointer oh, up or right okay, about your hairline. I got it. Sorry. Hey, it, if this is really boring, uh, I apologize, but, but I'm going to figure out how to do this here. Come on. I'm, I'm well, old. I'm old, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 50, uh, 52 years old, you know, I, I, I can't work these things all that great. Oh, there's my screen, right? Okay, here I go, here I go. Okay, here, bear with me here. I'm going to show you what the torpedoes look like. Oh, that's a video. I don't want to do that one. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, hold on, hold on. Well, but we can see them. Okay, yeah, That. so that's the torpedoes. I'm going to close this and I'm going to open up the, dang it, I'm, screwing up your show just, here. just click on that it says there you go okay all right here we go here okay this is where the pictures start and i'm gonna go full screen on here and i'll figure out how to do this thing in a minute okay there we go right so so that's what the torpedo contraption looks like right okay so the 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 small thing this right here this is the pump right and so this uh, i call it an octopus um so what we do is is this entire vessel has a cage inside of it um so perforated cage it's got a got a top to it it's got a bottom uh, sidewalls slide in there uh the bottom here has a uh centered rod that comes up through the center of the vessel all the way to the top of the bed of hops with perforations in it so we'll take beer out of the tank so coming out of one of these pipes i can't remember if it's uh it's which way is it going it's going this way down through this pipe here uh it gets distributed into the torpedoes and comes out 
through this valve here in the tank. And so, yeah, see, you got the down arrow. So your beer is coming out of the tank here, coming through here, coming through the pump, going through the bed of hops. Uh, we set the flow rate so that there's an even amount going through each torpedo. We run them for about 24 hours uh, and, and it drives back up into the tank. Uh, and these will be different um, uh, diameter pipes so that we get a little more velocity through a smaller pipe uh, coming in than coming out. So let's see if I can, there's the pumps kind of together. Now that's what the torpedo looks like uh, just sitting there. So you actually, if you if you if you go in there, what do you got? You got crystal mylar, uh, you got magnum, and you got citra. So as you as you're talking about this, uh, can that's you your, explain? That's, your, that's literally if if anyone wants to steal that, that's the dry hopping recipe right there. Amounts used, those are pounds, uh, 160, uh, 138 pounds of citrus. So, okay, and, go and ahead. Those are, and those are whole cone hops, correct? Uh, this is, yeah, but as you'll see mylar here, we take a portion of our hops. I was actually telling you that before is to try to ensure freshness throughout the uh, calendar year of making beer. Obviously, we're harvesting once a year and uh, uh, we want the, especially with whole cone hops, um, we want them to stay as uh, fresh as long as we can. Um, so we'll actually uh, take that and... Uh, and mylar wrap a certain portion of them and use those uh, over time. So, so just to explain, I guess a little bit, uh, you know, the the hops are just am amazingly subtle. I would say they're almost similar to your Sierra Nevada Pale Ale once they've been barrel aged. Yeah. So can Absolutely. can you explain a little bit what's going on there? Um. Actually, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to jump over here because someone said, and it was the same thing you said the other day. I have a Randall for dry hopping it. That's in, in essence. And you said that whenever I was showing you that picture, you're like, Oh, that's like a giant Randall. And, and it absolutely is a giant Randall, but we are actually going to say Sam Calgion stole the idea from us to make a Randall. Just saying it. Not really. And, and you I'm, just I'm done teasing. so publicly. I'm, I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh so, a good guy. Um, okay. So that question again. Uh, yeah. So, so I think at this point, do you have like a closing comment you want to make on barrel aging? And we jump into the question because we have 17 of them. Okay. Um, you know, uh, and I know it's probably going to be within some of the questions uh, that we have, um, you know, going back a little bit into barrel aging is uh, you never know what you're going to get. You know, it's almost like home brewing in, in a lot of ways. It's like, you know, I, I always tell, you know, new and up and coming home brewers and I home brewed before I started working here is, um, you know, always document what you do. I think if you really want to try to in, improve your uh, skills, um, you know, always, always write down what you're doing and kind of take some notes. Uh, if you, if you can't remember them, you know, definitely write them down, uh, you know, but some mental notes. Um, and, and the, the beauty of home brewing is, is, uh, experimenting, you know, I always, uh, I think one of your links that you have there is, uh, Ken's original pale ale recipe that's, uh, scaled down to a five gallon, uh, batch. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get homebrewers sometimes that kind of, uh, get on us a little bit like, Hey, I added, you know, the, uh, the C60 you told me and, and my celebration ale mock off is a little darker color than yours. Um, you know, every, Every brew house is different. You know, we have a different pale ale recipe. It's not uh, directly, even though we have two, two, uh, we have a 200 barrel brew house in Chico and a 200 barrel brew house in Mills River. Uh, the recipes don't line up exactly right. You know, so we, we, we manipulate those recipes as well. Um, just to, you know, you're going to have different boiling efficiencies and uh, different efficiencies throughout the process. Uh, in your brew house. So, so same with barrel aging, you know, you're, you're going to, every once in a while, you're going to get something that's not that good. Uh, but, but you gotta, you gotta keep going. And, and, you know, I know, I know one of the questions uh, is in regards to, um, well, I think it was yours about, you know, how do you, um, 
how do you ensure that you're going to have something that's good? And, you know, I, I definitely think start playing early on, playing with styles that kind of uh, are more favorable to dry hopping uh, or sorry, dry hopping, barrel aging. Um, so getting into something, you know, like an imperial stout or something that has a little bit more forgiveness Um you know, if, if you want to drink every ounce of your beer that you're making, you know, so, so when you're looking at a, a an Imperial stout, it, it, it can maybe, maybe hide some flaws, you know, I go back 40 years ago when Ken was starting the brewery, uh, his, his first batches of beer first, I think nine batches of beer that he made were, uh, were his stout recipe. So he could get the brew house dialed in before he was going to waste a pale ale. Uh, you know, so, uh, so that, that's, and that's always a trivia question on all of our stuff. What's, uh, Ken's very first beer he ever made and it's a stout. So, you know, so, so that, that being said, you know, some, some beer styles are more favorable to barrel aging than others. Uh, but you know, like you say, okay, they're not favorable, you know, so the IPA, and then I give it, I'll give you this, like, and you go, wow, that's really good because you can make magic every once in a while. It, it, it is phenomenal, I, I will have to say, uh, and totally unexpected. And it's unusual to barrel age uh, lighter colored beers, too, isn't it? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. And definitely, you're going to add some color to it, too. As someone yeah. asked here, Porter may be, may be interesting. Um, I would I would I would highly suggest uh, uh, barrel aged uh, Baltic porters or or killer. Well, is that is that sort of the difference there? Because isn't your torpedo about the same color as the pale ale? Um, no, it's a little darker. It's all it's darker. always a little darker, um, and definitely you know it's uh, it, it's probably picked up a little bit of color. Uh, from from what torpedo is, it almost looks a little to me. Uh, it's got a little more of a brown hue to it than what uh, traditional uh, torpedo is like. Maybe a little bit more red than this one, so it'll pick up some color during that aging aging process. So getting back to that Baltic porter, also too, I would encourage people if you're going to really play with uh, barrel aging uh, beers, start start playing with some. Uh, things to add to it, you know, a, a Baltic porter with uh, some toasted coconut. Mm, that good, that good. Really I, good. I like Peter's question, and we'll we'll move into the rest of them. But I think this is a good one. Peter says, given that pasteurization is used, presumably there's no benefit for further aging, and I think assume he's presuming like our Narwhal in the can. Yeah, that would be my assumption is what he's getting at that. Uh, and and yes, I would agree with that. Um, although I would say that uh, when we have played with that before, uh, when you start getting into, you know, some beers like uh, Barrel Age Narwhal, you're probably not going to have too much uh, uh, negative aging characteristics in my personal opinion uh if you kind of age that out because we've we've had barrel aged narwhal uh bottles that we originally did that will pop and they're uh you know you start getting a little bit more like chocolate notes and yeah you get some oxidized notes you get maybe a little bit of uh kind of uh you can perceive them the soy sauce type of characteristics uh, that you would generally see with oxidation um, yeah, if soy sauce is uh, subtle, though, I don't find it objectionable. No, and, and it depends on what kind of beer it's in, too. Um, so that's, you know, uh, so so definitely, you know, some of the lighter styles, you know, if you would, if you took a lighter porter style, uh, you would probably want to drink that pretty fresh. You know, that's one of the things with my Alpha Hop Society. It's, you know, you tasted that one beer. We did a cream ale, uh, orange cream ale. That, that was um, very nice. Yeah, that was done in bourbon barrels and and with fresh uh, uh, orange rinds uh, in it, and it is it, phenomenal. I can't see that thing aging at at six months. And honestly, I'm gonna I'm gonna be totally uh, upfront. Is literally every single beer that we put into package 
um, that's something new for us, we don't even know. You know, like I always tell, I always tell the members of Alpha Hop, I'm giving you a suggestion of how long you should maybe like drink this within six months. And I don't know, maybe it's better after six months. Maybe it's not. We're, we just try to go off of what uh, historically we've we've learned over time. And sometimes we're wrong and sometimes we're uh, spot on right. Um, so, but so but, let's move into the questions, if you don't okay. mind, Terry. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, you know me, uh, I'm and, and, yeah. And those of you that may need to go uh, because you've given us a lot of time already. No, if you've asked a question, you will get an email. Uh, with the question being answered. So if you need to cut out, we completely understand that. I hope you'll all stay, but I appreciate your generosity and your time today. So we are going to move into the questions. Uh, and Chris says, thanks for all you, Ken, Brian, and the entire team do. So thank you, Crispy. So the first question, uh, Terrence is, when do you know a barrel is no longer suited for beer? I know bourbon slash rum character fades in a few batches. Can you rechar the inside and restore the ends? We ain't going to bother doing that. Uh, no, um, uh, that's a great question. Um, we, we played with a little bit of, uh, second use barrels, uh, generally speaking, uh, everything we produce is single use. And, and I know that's very expensive, uh, and especially very expensive for smaller breweries. Um, we've just found that uh, some of the characteristics, especially when you start aging beers for 12 months uh, in some of those barrels, you, you really, uh, it, it, it's less than ideal for, uh, for the following flavor. So like, especially like something like our barrel aged narwhal, uh, the one that we, we tasted that's in a can, this will probably always be single use uh, bourbon barrels for the sheer fact of uh, we have to match consistency from, from year to year, or sorry, batch to batch. And, and if we carry this, uh, uh, this particular package on for, uh, several years, uh, as a brand of ours, uh, we don't, we don't want it to vary, um, where it starts kind of getting a little bit, uh, softer in bourbon characteristics. So, uh, so that said, uh, you know, we, we haven't done a lot of research and look, I know we've, we've done, uh, second use and it's, it's definitely noticeable that it's dropped a little bit. Uh, now you can blend that with um, with uh, one use barrels, single use barrels, uh, and probably be perfectly fine. Uh, we did do some experiments with some, uh, you know, third use is uh, you pretty much you're spent. You're getting a lot of just uh, oak barrel characteristics, which aren't bad either for certain style beers, right? So, thank you, Joseph. I had that same question. So our next one comes from Jimmy, and by the way. If you've got to run, everybody gets one vote. So if you see a question there, you won't push to the top. Uh, look into the questions, put in your one vote, and that will be uh, yeah. answered quicker than the others. Jo Joseph has a good point there, too. Sour, using it for sour use. So taking some of those spent barrels and using them. I assume that's what he's, he's referring to. So. so Jimmy asks, what are some homebrew scale options for getting barrel character? What products are more ideal and less ideal? What would be the minimum barrel size you'd recommend? Five gallons, 15 gallons. Um, I, you know, I, I, I probably, I don't, I don't know if I can really answer that great. If, if I was, uh, and obviously we don't do a lot of stuff with uh, homebrew scale. Um, but if, if I was going to go that route, uh, and probably some people can chime in over here on the side and probably answer it way better than I can. Uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, spiles and actually soaking spiles, um, you know, I, I would definitely soak. I wouldn't just add uh, bourbon directly in, you know. Um, it, I, I, would, I would save the bourbon for a glass of ice and uh, and, and go that route, uh, personally, but, uh, you know, I, I would start small. I would, I would start with, you know, five gallon if I was going to do it. And, uh, 
and so you're not getting too far in and too committed uh, to it. So, and and taste all along. Oh, I think so. Um, you know, yeah. we we've we've definitely. Um, you know, you're going to want to give absolutely some time, right? Um, but we we found barrels uh, that we lost. You know, I was telling that story. You know, we lose barrels all the time in that room, and uh, and we've grabbed some barrels that were uh, less than ideal. That that went like, oh wow, they went way too far, and we're too. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it's it's weird because we're a big brewery, but we're pretty frugal about certain stuff, you know. I mean, Ken still, you know, he drives just a normal car, you know, and uh, and definitely we've we've come back to barrels and went, whoa, holy mackerel, you know. It's almost it's almost like it went on a on a cycle of like, oh well, it, it's, it's way too long in the barrel. Let's dump it. No, let's not dump it. Let's just hold so, on. So to is it. that a real important point, Terrence? If you taste it and you hate it, don't dump it. Leave it in there some longer. Eh, I guess it depends on uh, what part of hate uh, that you that you found. You know, it tastes it, like it, rocket fuel. Are we done? It, it, yeah, probably so. If it's it's <laughs> vinegar, yeah, you probably uh, you, you probably uh, don't want it. But uh, but definitely, we've had some that have gone sour on us that uh, that we went well. Let's move this to the other room uh, and and start uh, running this in the sour program. Um, you know. Uh, definitely we've had some that have gotten some bread in them and we move those over into the sour room and, uh, uh, and use those to blend in on some, some really killer beers, you know? All right. It's a good question, Jimmy. And yeah. again, uh, vote up the questions. Uh, if you want some push to the top, uh, the next one is from Scotty B and he says, what type of barrel would you not use? Uh, um, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's really a, a type of barrel I would not use probably a uh, Tabasco, uh, but, um, definitely How about one with metal in it. <laughs> yeah. One with metal in it. Don't use those, uh, make sure whatever you're doing, you're inspecting, uh, especially if you're, you're on a kind of a larger scale and you're, you're maybe a uh, brew pub in it and you, you got some, you're going to invest a little bit on some barrels. Do some do some great investigation uh, of the barrels. Know where you're buying the barrels. No, uh, I'll I will say some of uh, well our absolute best results are when we get uh, when we get wet barrels. So when they're they're pretty close, like if they're bone dry. Eh, uh, that's whenever you start getting some uh, some worries with infection and uh, some some. Uh, other issues uh, that you might run into uh, down the stretch. Well, just as a sensory aspect, if it looks good and smells good, is that a good rule of thumb? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what we do. We, we get a flashlight, inspect the inside, kind of look around. Uh, you're looking for any dry spots, any mold, anything like that. Um, you're definitely, uh, uh, smells good. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a key. Yeah. Okay. So, so evaluate it like I, you would remember, a good beer. Yeah. I, I, I remember one time we did this, uh, when there was the hop shortage back in whatever, 2000, 2008 or whatever, we had that big hop shortage. And of course we were well leveraged on hops and, uh, and we got a call from, uh, uh, brew dogs, uh, and they, they needed some hops and they're like, whatever you got. And we're like, yeah, we got a lot of cascade. You want some cascade? And they're like, yeah, we'll send you some barrels. Uh, and so they sent us some barrels. And if you actually go to that, uh, that, uh, forum, uh, our, our, uh, uh, blog page, uh, about barrel aging, there's a picture of me rolling me and, uh, one of my coworkers, Jeff White, uh, one of our barrel head barrel guys, uh, rolling some, uh, single malt scotch barrels uh out of a container and uh i am not going to lie uh when we opened up that container um the barrels were so wet uh that were in there um that it absolutely reeked of single malt scotch and we sw we swore by the end of transferring all those barrels out of that container 
uh, that both of us had a slight buzz from just the alcohol in the air. Um, so when they talk about the angel share, it was definitely riding at the top of that container. It, it, was, pretty, it was pretty awesome. It's a uh, you know, highlight of my career. One of the All right. Good, good question, Scotty. Uh, Jimmy has our next. Well, let's see. This thing is not reordering like it should. So I think actually Jason has our next question. Uh, how do you prepare a barrel for a follow on beer after you've used it once? Cleaning products and temperatures. We've never we've never we've maybe rinsed, um, you know, with like uh some sort of sterile water, like ozonated water, uh, and then purged really well. Um, we we've literally like knowing that we're we're going to top off those barrels. Um, we would we would transfer out and then bring bring beer right back on them. So, coming back to what you would do and evaluate it. If it looks good and smells good, you yeah. Clean it up good and move on? Yeah. Good question. All right. Uh, next one. Jimmy, let's see. Why oh, this thing's not reordering? Okay. Nick asks, can you recommend sources for barrels? Oh, I, I, I don't do that anymore. Um, that's kind of, that would be one of those ones if you wanted to, uh, uh, we, we suggested that if you want to email anything to me, uh, info at Sierra Nevada, uh, would be perfect and just address it, uh, that, that you want the question to go to me. Um, and I can, I can run that down. I don't know who it's changed so many times over the years. And, uh, and it's, uh, I honestly don't know. They have several vendors that they, uh, uh, that they purchased through and I couldn't tell you exactly, um. And, 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 and different vendors for different styles. We have a couple like really nice uh, Kentucky bourbon barrel suppliers that, that really. It, it sounds like that one's an uphill question, though. The, yeah. You don't yeah. deal in small quantities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, I don't even I don't even do that part of it anymore. I, I was barely in that process years ago. Um, I let the barrel guys take care of that stuff and they know where to get them. So I, I know, Nick, I've had a little bit of luck talking to local distillers and getting on their list. Oh yeah. That a, a great suggestion. Yeah. Thanks Doug. Thanks for yep. uh, taking that one. Cause that's, but that's definitely their not one contribution. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, literally like, uh, you know, it's one of those things like, uh, uh, you know, they always say it takes a lot of beer to make great wine. Uh, winemakers love trading, uh, uh, trading wine for beer. Uh, and same with, uh, you know, it, spirit makers or distillers are, are definitely, uh, in that, uh, favor too. So, um, believe me, we, we, we get a lot of, a lot of beer down to St. George distillery, uh, and, uh, we get a lot of, uh, barrels and other stuff in return. So. All right. So Jimmy has another question, uh, and I'll also read Joseph had given him an answer. So that'll give you a chance to think a moment and maybe enjoy some of this beer uh, that we haven't finished yet. Uh, is there a simple time frame for how long to store clean beers or mixed fermentation beers so you aren't constantly opening the bung? And while you're thinking, Joseph answered, I have drilled a small bore in my barrels and seal it with a stainless nail. I sample the beer until good beer and then rack it. That's that's exactly what we do. All of our, all, all of our barrels, uh, and and we have a, a fun little game when we go on tours. It's called pulling the nail, uh, and that's uh, that's a joyous uh, time. Uh, but yeah, we 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 ran into issues with that. We tended to see more barrels kind of kind of go south on us uh, when we were constantly pulling the bung out the top, and you know you got to kind of. Uh, you know, Ken has always wanted us to to fix that entire room where every single barrel had uh, a little bit of positive uh, CO2 pressure on it. Uh, we've never really got around to doing it. It'd be an absolute nightmare. Uh, but again, he's a perfectionist. So um, if he, he's listening in, uh, that'll probably be back on the uh, 
uh, the top of the list of things to do. Uh, but uh, but anyways, I just reminded them. But anyway, so uh, th that being said, uh, the nail nail is is the best option, and we we learned that from uh, Vinny Chilerzo over at uh, Russian River. Uh, he kind of taught us that. He's like, stop getting that wine thief and taking it out of the top. Just put a put a nail hole in it. So you'll want to put a nail hole in uh, just before you fill it and get a get a stash of stainless steel nails. Good. All right. Next question. I'm scrolling through these again. Vote if you want to hurry one up. Uh, this one comes from Jason. A bit like Jimmy's questions for small scale. Can we achieve similar result with oak chips? Absolutely. I, I, I think so. Yep. Absolutely. And I would, if you want bourbon characteristics, I would soak them. I think that's, uh, that's one of the best things to do. Uh, we did a lot what is of the difference between soaking and just adding a little bit of bourbon. I don't know. It just makes me, I, 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 I feel better about it. Right. <laughs> You're just taking a jug and I like, like that answer. Jug, you know, it, it's like, it seems like it's, it's, you know, and probably also too, is you're going to get, um, uh, you're going to wet that Oak too. I think you're going to wet those spiles and, uh, you know, you're going to get a, 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 maybe a and i don't know who knows if that actually because because we know that like a, a wet barrel you're gonna get a slow absorption of of the bourbon uh as as everything kind of uh comes to equilibrium of you know uh through osmosis of that little bit of beer going into the barrel and that little bit of bourbon coming out of the barrel and uh you know where where you get a a a slower process, I guess, than, than just dumping a, a, a glugger of a whiskey in your barrel. I mean, so sure. The, the short answer is absolutely. That, that'll work. I mean, they both, they both work and, and uh, you know, I don't know. It's just something about the, uh, I don't know, the nuances of, uh, of soaking that. And it's kind of the, it's like the ritual of, uh, of, of, of working through a recipe as you're making dinner, right? You know, it's like some of the well, little. Now Andy adds an interesting comment. He says probably not great for head retention to add liquor. Yeah, true. Yeah. Good point, Andy. Awesome. All right, we got uh, just a uh, well, we got a dozen more. <laughs> so yeah. again, vote them up. Um, Next question. Barrel aging seems risky and can yield unpredictable results. So when barrel aging, how can you maximize the chances of a delicious barrel aged beer? Who asked that question? <laughs> that was me. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm like Ken. I'm into this low risk stuff. <laughs> I, I think that, that's what I was getting at is like starting to look at, you know, de different and, you know, until you really want to experiment and, and, uh, and go out there and like, Oh, okay. I'm going to barrel age a IPA. Uh, which most people would think you're an idiot for doing, um, but we we like to maybe prove them wrong. Uh, I, I think you start getting into those styles that that lend better to barrel aging. You know your imperial stouts, your uh, darker, robust porters, um, your your quads. You know we've aged we've aged Belgian doubles that were killer. So, so as a percentage, what could you throw out a number of what percentage of your beers turn out acceptable and you don't have to dump when barrel aging? Just a wild guess. I'm sure it's not a statistic. Yeah, here. I would say probably, I, I would say if, if, if I had to throw a number down, I bet we, we dump 15 to 20%, maybe, maybe okay. not quite that much. So 80 or 85%. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll really hold on to some, you know, like, like the, the scotch in, in that we put in that pigs in a kilt, like it's, it's really, I mean, if you love peated single malt scotch, it's, it's, it's awesome as a standalone beer, but your, your, your window of drinker is about this big, um, you know? Uh, so if you can blend it with some, Maple syrup, uh, barrel aged narwhal. Uh, you're probably gonna uh, get uh, quite a few more 
uh, consumers that are going to be like, oh yeah. I mean, we, but we do, we still do those other ones too. It's just, um, you know, it, and that's what I, that's what I think the, the really beautiful thing is when you start getting a barrel room like we have, uh, and you, you start kind of having all these barrels around, uh, it, that's some of the funnest stuff is like pulling the nails and like, oh yeah, okay, we got a, we got a habanero, uh, what do we do? We did a saison with habaneros in a uh, uh, in a uh, sherry barrel. Um, they're just killer. But like, oh man, not not too many people. Like, okay, here, blend this brown ale into it, and it's like, oh wow, it just like kind of all those flavors just meld together, right? And and so that crispy fry says a Tabasco barrel aged pilsner for the next seltzer. Yeah, right. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> all right next question and again vote them up if you're in a hurry to hear the answer uh this one comes from paul can you explain your standard operating procedures once you receive a barrel and start filling it up do you empty the remaining liquor that is still in the barrel uh we we actually do and i'll tell a little i'm gonna get i'm gonna get myself in trouble um so they used to you're, they, you're monk's friends here yeah, terrence i know i know no 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 i'm i'm i'm, I'm worried ttb's listening no um uh, uh i should have said that huh uh anyways uh it's uh, uh we we dump them out especially if they're really really wet uh technically we're not supposed to go over a certain abv uh when we're adding to those barrels or we try not to really uh because then you start getting like your it's getting too hot and you got almost too much uh, stuff going on. Um, we, we drain them out and we've literally uh, at one point, I know we got this big run of bourbon one time and they were so wet uh, that we almost filled a five gallon bucket of uh, um, barrel strength uh, bourbon. Wow. We dumped it down the drain. That is a really good question, though. I like that. Yeah. All right. Our next question. Prior to blending barrels to do a bottling run, are you doing QC? And to what extent do you oh, isolate yeah. barrels with issues or dump them? Goose Island many years ago ran an infection with, oh, I don't know that I can pronounce this. I will try. Well, Baduna, ba Baduna, maybe uh, that black mold that occurs on the Rick houses at distilleries in Kentucky. Have you ever had issues with that? Thanks for sharing your knowledge. This comes from Todd. Uh, we we have uh, we have well, I know we've seen it because we've seen it on the barrels uh, on the outside. Um, uh, we generally kind of isolate those out. Um, probably some of those when we've done really small runs of barrel age beers um, and especially ones, you know, a lot of times we're doing uh, very small volumes, you know, maybe like 25 gallon kegs and we're doing them for events. Uh, and we generally always have, uh, you know, it's, it's a supporting beer for an event. Um, we'll always have somebody uh, that's very knowledgeable in our, our styles of beer and, and what we're doing, whether it's a brewer, or myself, or Ken, or uh, Steve Grossman. Um, so we, we, a lot of times we'll, we'll taste beers. We've rarely, you know, been, a, been at a festival or at, at an event and said, ooh, we're not going to pour that. Um, so we probably had something similar in, in our barrels at some point. We, we get to a point when we're doing small runs like that and our micro department doesn't even care to look at it because they know it's going to just be loaded with uh, certain, certain, uh, uh, you know, molds or, uh, bacteria, you know, as long as it's not beer spoiling, we'll look at it generally on beer spoiling bacteria. But, um, that, that said, um, uh, we we do taste the barrels so when we're we're actually going through uh the guys will uh bring all the beer to the brewery uh, when we're transferring into tanks um uh we we use a simple 
uh, piece of chalk. Uh, so they'll line up 20, 30, 40 barrels uh, and go through and taste each one of them and give it a check or give it an X. Uh, and X get stumped, and that's probably that 15% that, uh, that we see that probably uh, go down the drain uh, and we don't add those. So, so it sounds like you're primarily well. dependent on your, your sensory aspect of it. Taste it as you go along. Yeah. And it is also the quality, quality control aspect of it. You know, like, uh, as I was saying earlier, when we're doing it in large runs that are going to see a, a shelf and a can or a bottle that could have some issues, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, exploding bottle or a can or something of that nature where we would have some secondary fermentation that's going to go uh, nuts on us. You know, all, all those beers are pasteurized uh, so that we're, we're ensuring. And then in those, we will run through micro, you know, just to uh, check our system and uh, our P's and Q's, you know. Okay. Uh, Terrence, we do have a hard stop in a little over 14 minutes and we have nine okay. questions to go. So we're going to probably have to do quick questions okay. from this point going forward. Quick answer, excuse me. <laughs> um, Andy asks, before you put a beer in a barrel for the first time, do you have any sort of procedures in place to sanitize the barrel to decrease likelihood of contamination? And, and before you answer, Joseph says, sometimes the Brett pedo character, et cetera, acts as a complexity of the van vanilla notes in an oak barrel. Mm. So, so getting to that, that, that first part, uh, we have, um, and, and I, I kind of misspoke a little bit earlier. We have, we've had used uh, sulfur at times uh, when we've dealt with uh, wine barrels. Uh, so that's one because we find that wine barrels can be very, those can be very problematic uh, when you're starting to introduce them into your barrel room uh, uh, because how long they've been sitting, where they've been sitting, um, even if they come in a little wet uh, with the low ABV, um, you can have some major issues with those. So we have sulfured those before uh, on occasion. So um Okay, and then so sometimes the Brett and Peter, uh, 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 yes, uh, absolutely, and we've seen that on our, our especially some of our wine, uh, wine barrel aged uh, items uh, we found. And if it gets overwhelming and it's kind of uh, something that uh, is not uh, within the wheelhouse of what we want the fi final flavor of that beer to be, um, we will take those over. And uh, you know the beauty of having a large barrel program that we have is uh, that's probably going to be destined for some sort of barrel aged uh, beer down the road uh, that is going to be a, more on a sour, sour side of things. So. All right. <clears throat> Susan Reinkert has a couple of questions here. Um, first one is uh, Jeff and Susan Reinkert here in Milford, Michigan. So I, <laughs> I know Jeff, I don't know that I've met Susan. Oh, uh, Beautiful lady. Yes. Wonderful to have you here. And the next one is also Jeff Reinkert here. Any hints on the Oktoberfest German partner this year? If you can't say, I understand. Are you guys going to be the first to know? Uh, Jeff, you're going to be, you're going to be upset at me. Um, we are not going to partner with anybody this year. Um, which is, oh. I know, don't, don't get mad at me. Don't, don't, don't shoot the messenger. Um, yeah, we, we were, we were, uh, kind of going back and forth. Um, and, uh, we kind of, uh, we, we kind of want to go on our own thing. Uh, uh, we, we loved our partnerships that we did. Um, uh, so, so I, I don't I don't know how to how, how to answer that nicely. Uh, I mean, we're we're just we, they, they kind of came down to like the the eleventh hour, and we're like, okay, let's let's just go ahead and and make our own Oktoberfest, um, go that route, uh, and and see. Um, it's a tough. Uh, you know, and I'll get I'll get a little deep in in the woods here. You know, it's uh, in, in a lot of ways Sierra Nevada. 
um, is, is old school. Uh, we do a lot of things a little bit different uh, than a lot of breweries. Uh, but it does come down uh, at, at some point to um, uh, selling beer on occasion. Uh, we, we always struggle with, and seasonals are down across the board for uh, every single brewery uh, out there. Um, and, uh, and I love seasonal beers because it's really, you know, it's, it's like the, the, it's the same thing. It's like, I, I don't want summer all year round. Right. And, uh, I don't want winter all year round. Uh, so I look forward to the changes of the season. And when I, when I talk about that, it's more of like as a traditional brewer and someone that was raised, uh, with more of a traditional brewing background is I, I look forward to spring when, uh, you know, my box came out and, uh, kind of a little easier drinking beers or, you know, like we're, we're always forced, like, and we're not forced. I know 10 minutes, we have uh, 10 minutes and seven okay. questions. <laughs> okay. We're, we're not always forced uh, or we, I feel like sometimes we are forced by the consumer that we have to have an IPA in, in, in every single, and I love IPAs, don't get me wrong. Uh, but, you know, our, our spring seasonal, we always fought with that one. And why it's the spring seasonal, I don't know. But it's January to, uh, through March. Uh, it's just, you know, it's the 40th anniversary Hoppy IPA. And it's like, you know, it, it's done pretty well. It did better than the Brood IPA last year. But, uh, you know, sometimes some of those decisions come down to uh, uh, they, they do <laughs> become business decisions. And, and unfortunately, that's kind of. Uh, the area where we're we're at now with it, just how the industry is. I'm going to just bring up. I'm like, this is a total bummer, right? I'm like bringing up bummer. <laughs> well, no, I'll, I'll add one thing, Terrence. So, and you heard Scott Jennings talking about this. He is going to help us do kind of an exclusive on the celebration ale this fall. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of seasonal beers, we're going to have some coverage on that, which will be fun. That one. It, my favorite beer, my favorite beer yeah. we make. I mean, it is like that is in, in, in to get back to what I was saying about waiting for that season to change. It's like when that thing comes or when that beer is on tap, it's like it's like a little piece of heaven. Let's see, right. right, right there on your screen, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, right there. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's rip through these other questions. Sorry, one, one, one minute a piece. Okay, all right. So, um, Mark, how long do you age the beer? Uh, barrel aging depends on the style of beer. So, uh, when you get probably bigger, general rule of thumb, uh, larger the AB, higher the ABV, uh, more more dark and intense the flavors are, probably longer you're going to age it. My personal opinion. All right. Next question comes from Scotty B. So any vanilla beans in the base of the Narwhal beer recipe? Oh, oh, no, it just comes out. Um, That's a really short answer. <laughs> but okay. I think because we're, we're talking about doing little variants of, uh, of this particular beer and we experimented with a peanut butter version of this and it was really killer. And I, and, if we do it, it's going to be exclusive to our gift shops. So stay tuned. If that ends up coming up, you need to get some friends to go over there, buy you some, and uh, ship it to you if you don't live close by. Well, I, I trust you now. You, you steered me well on this barrel-aged torpedo. I, I'm a little res, reticent on the peanut butter one, but but I'm, sounds I'm, interesting. I'm not a fan, but I tasted it. Uh, I always, uh, I always say that uh, peanut butter beers remind me of, uh, again, of my father, and he used to love peanuts, and he used to leave cans of peanuts laying around the house, and every once in a while you'd grab one and you'd reach inside, and it was all rancid. Uh, so, so that always reminds me of that whenever I have peanut butter and, and a, a, a peanut butter beer. So, anyway. so, so we're down to six minutes. And we have four questions. So Jason is asking, when you put beer in barrels, is it right at the end of fermentation without filtering? So it has the remains of yeast in the barrels. And do you put anything else in the barrels with the beer? 
Yeah, we we uh, we add so it's post fermentation. So the fermentation is done. Uh, generally speaking, it's it's probably pretty. It, we'll chill it down just to get most of the sediment to drop out of it. Um, so usually we'll drop to like the barrel age in our wall is down to 45 degrees. We start getting some of that. We don't want all the sediment in the barrels. Um, so we'll try to get as much out as possible uh, without filtering. Um, and then we don't add anything else unless it actually requires via recipe. So if we're so, so you minimize the yeast. We minimize the yeast. Yeah, it's still going to have some yeast in it, though. Um, but definitely we, we'll only add, and a lot of times when we're adding something else in it, coffee or something like that, we do that a, pretty close to actually when we're going to package. So that, that characteristic is fresh as possible, uh, whether it's vanilla beans, uh, coconut, uh, coffee, whatever. Okay. Five questions in four minutes. Okay. <laughs> oh, Victor asks, do you, did you recently change all cascade and pay excuse, let me try this again yes i know did exactly. you recently change to yes. all cascade and pale ale i remember seeing magnum and pearl uh, listed before I, I will yes uh and and i apologize for this i lost the argument um we will substitute originally when i started working here it was pearl as a bittering hops and and we switch to Magnum and we would go back to Pearl. We go to Magnum. We, we still add a little bit of bittering hop that is not Cascade. But the, the thought was to just go 100% Cascade because we're probably not getting too much uh, from the, the Magnum Pearl anyways in the finished beer. Uh, and, and I lost that argument of let's just change the website so it's 100% Cascade. Okay. Make up, you got some – you got some uh, – actual truth out of me there uh that again i'll probably get in trouble for uh okay can you add uh sorbate or sulfite to the barrel of beer to prevent infection uh well, let me let me add one thing i see jeff rankert on there and and i mentioned the aha governing committee i know jeff is running also for a renewal on him and, and jeff is such a great guy if you haven't voted yet please consider voting for jeff and i appreciate all the great questions all right so so don asked the almost the second to the last question can you add sorbate and sulfite to a barrel of beer to prevent infection understand it will have to be force carved uh i know sulfites are added i've ne we've never played with sorbates so yeah all right last question and we've got just a couple of minutes left this comes from Kristen. how much oak chips per gallon do you recommend uh i'm not going to recommend any because i uh, we we have rarely used oak chips so there's probably someone on here. Please, someone write in really quick. How much would you use? I, I bet I, Jeff knows. <laughs> and, no, and Joseph no. and, and a bunch of others. So write that in the chat. So as we wrap up, Terrence, we've got about two minutes. And this is a hard stop at 120 minutes. It literally will turn off. Okay. Uh, Peter Simmons says, great stuff today. Cheers to both. Jeff says, thanks, Doug. Uh Jeff also says, thanks for all you know, Terrence, uh, lots of people appreciating it. So Terrence, in the last few minutes, 90 seconds, how would you summarize barrel aging and recommendation for those of us that love it and want to do more of it? Just keep doing it. Because really, uh, I, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I tell a lot of people about our program and what's going on, and I haven't said it yet, I'm going to say it now. Um, we learn every single day, like literally we learn, well, when we drink barrel aged beers every single day, which we don't do it every single day. Um, we take Saturdays and Sundays off uh, on occasion. Um, but it, it's literally, it's, it's, it's a work in progress all, all the time. And you learn something new all the time and just keep doing it. There, there is just just some magic that can that can come from uh, barrel aging beers and and just love love doing it and love seeing what actually comes out. You know, our alpha hop program is an excellent example of what happens with certain ingredients. So, 
Well, and I want to share those beautiful beers. I didn't center them up perfectly, but what a beautiful array of delicious beers. We have 30 seconds before a hard stop. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. This was so much fun. Terrence, thank you for all this time. You've been so generous and we've had such delicious beers. I, I can't thank you enough. Hey, I'm I'm right at the, the start of my uh, probably 10 day vacation. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. So great hanging out with all of you. Um, great program you do, Doug. Uh, this is really, truly amazing. Got to get more of, our, more of our employees on here. Cheers. Cheers.